Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry. Welcome to Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. Folks, it's fair to say that weight loss tips and weight loss interviews are some of the most popular episodes we've done on Real Health over the course of the last two and a half years. They're always incredibly popular. People struggle with their weight, their lifestyle, and their exercise, and are always looking for tips and tools to improve that. I have to say, I'm really, really looking forward to this week's guest. It's the next in our series of international experts from around the world. And my guest for this week's show is Dr. Jason Fung, who's a world leading expert on intermittent fasting and obesity. He's written three best selling health books and has co founded the Intensive Dietary Management Program. I'm delighted to say he joins me all the way from Toronto in Canada today. Jason, welcome to Real Health. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. So, uh, I, I, I've been reading your book. It's absolutely fascinating. And we're going to get to that in a little while. But first, I want to chat about you and you know, why you chose to specialize in obesity and fasting and why it interests you so much. Yeah, so I'm actually trained in internal medicine and nephrology, which is kidney disease. And what's happened over the past, say, 20 years that I've been put in practice is that we've seen this obesity epidemic, which is followed very closely by uh, this epidemic of type 2 diabetes, and type 2 diabetes is the most common cause of kidney disease by far. So that's how I sort of got into it. And it was very interesting because um, when I went through medical school and so on in the 90s, of course, we talked all about um, drugs, about how to treat it. But as I got into practice, what became very quickly clear is that that sort of approach of, you know, doing dialysis and treating people with drugs is really not very effective. It's um, not looking at the sort of root cause of the problem because if you think about the term diabetic kidney disease, the answer sort of lies right there. So if you have kidney disease due to diabetes, go and get rid of the diabetes, you won't get kidney disease. So how do you get rid of the type 2 diabetes? Well, you lose weight. That's sort of an open secret. Everybody pretends that type 2 diabetes is irreversible and chronic. But the truth is that everybody knows that if you lose weight, almost certainly that type 2 diabetes will disappear. So it's sort of like, well, if you don't become overweight or obese, then you don't become type 2 diabetic, which means you don't get kidney disease, which is a far preferable way to treat people than, you know, hey, just wait till they get kidney disease and give them some drugs that work marginally effectively. It's sort of like changing the oil in your car. It's much better to do that than to wait for it to break down and then try to fix it. But that's what the focus of medicine was, was to try and fix it after things got broken. So the question really was then, how do you lose weight? And that's how I got into the whole question because as I looked into it further and further, it was very clear that the way that we approached weight, how, weight loss and how to lose weight was completely incorrect from a scientific standpoint. That is, we focused completely on cutting calories and counting calories and so on, which is sort of the wrong approach um, because calories were not the most important factor. That is to say that we were pretending that if you ate 500 calories of you know, grilled salmon on a salad is the same fattening wise as 500 calories of cookies and sugary soda, right? So the, the problem with that, of course, other than the vitamins that you get, right? So you could take a multivitamin with your cookies and sugary drink. It's still not going to be the equivalent in terms of fattening effect as that grilled salmon on salad sort of thing. So we were pretending that these two things were the same. But the, the problem is that when you eat salmon versus when or vegetables or broccoli, compared to when you eat cookies, the, the moment you eat it, the hormonal effects on our body are completely different, like night and day. Our res body responds to the salad completely different than it responds to the cookies. That is, insulin goes up and, uh, you know, other things go up and other hormones go down. But the hormonal response was totally different. And our body listens to hormones. That's the language that our body listens to, right? So whether you gain body fat or not, it depends on the hormones in your body telling us to gain body fat or not. So here it was, this, this total disconnect between the message that we are given, 
that calories are sort of equal and as long as you cut your calories, it's okay. So you could cut out your broccoli and eat some cookies because they're the same calories, that kind of nonsense. Um, there's a huge disconnect between the scientific reality, which has been known for 50 years, and the message we're given. And the message we're given was so bad that it was leading a lot of people to say, well, you know, make choices that led to obesity. And that's what I was trying to get through in the obesity code. Of course, calories in and calories out and calorie deficit are probably three of the most popular words uh, when it comes to health, whether it's on Instagram or personal trainers or whatever it may be. They're words that our listeners will be, you know, I, I see it myself when I do Q&As on Instagram. Every second question is, what's a calorie de deficit? How do I calorie deficit? You know, they're very much the big trends for, for, for health at the moment and for trainers and for people who are going to gyms. It's about calorie. They're looking at calorie deficits and you're saying that's not necessarily the way to do it. Well, the problem is this. When you look at the sort of energy balance equation, which is the body fat you gain equals calories in, calories out. It's not, it's correct, but it's not useful in that it doesn't tell you sort of what controls your calories in and what controls your calories out. So essentially what calories in, calories out is, is, is a sort of proximate cause. So let's take an analogy, for example. Say I tell you uh, if an airplane crashes or it doesn't crash, it depends on the force of lift and the force of gravity. That's just pure physics. It's always true. So then if you take that equation and say, okay, lift versus gravity, um, the way to prevent all plane crashes in the future is to have bigger wings and less weight. Well, that won't get you anywhere because if you have, say, bad maintenance schedule and stuff breaks or you have a bad design like the Boeing 3737 and there's a mechanical error, it's going to crash. Bigger wings is not going to fix your, your 737, right? Or putting on less passengers is not going to prevent the crash. So you have to go sort of one step deeper into what is it that is affecting the lift and the gravity, right? So you have to say, well, is it uh, maintenance schedules? Is it bad weather? Is it pilot training? And those sort of things are going to make a difference because now you've gotten to the root cause of why the lift and the gravity go up or down, right? So it's the same with calories in, calories out. If you say, well, it's just calories in, calories out, that's always true. That's just physics but it doesn't tell you anything about why you're eating more. So the question is, why is it that people eat more? Like why is calories in higher? Well, the answer is not just willpower and stuff. There's a lot that goes into it. And essentially it all comes back to your hormones. So we have very powerful hormones in our body to tell us to eat. And they're very powerful hormones to tell us to stop eating, for example. So uh, there are these so-called satiety hormones like, um, you know, uh, peptide YY and cholecystokinin, and we have stretch receptors in the stomach and all kinds of receptors that tell us to stop eating. They're actually very powerful. So if you ever uh, eat a full buffet, say you eat a huge meal, you're totally stuffed and somebody says, hey, have another pork chop. You'd be like, no, I'm going to throw up because those satiety hormones basically shut us down. We can't eat. So therefore, and we have hunger hormones called ghrelin, for example, so that tell us that we should eat. So this sort of hunger signaling is all hormonally based, and that is what determines how many calories we take. And that's controlled by the foods that we eat. So for example, if you eat a, a big portion of steak and eggs for breakfast, for example, compared to if you ate a couple of glasses of apple juice and a sugary soda, they might calorically be equal, but one is going to make you full and one is not going to make you full, right? So if after you've eaten that huge meal of, you know, for at an all you can eat buffet, you're not going to eat a steak again, because you're going to throw up, but you could eat cookies because those cookies, those highly refined sugars and carbohydrates, they don't activate any satiety signaling. You could drink a Coca-Cola, even though it's like 500 calories, because there's no satiety signaling for that. So it all comes down to the hormones that controls our calories in. Same with the calories out. So everybody says calories out is exercise. It's not exercise. The huge, vast majority of calories out 
is basal metabolic rate. So that's the energy it takes for you to keep your brain and your heart and your kidneys functioning in a normal manner. And so people say, well, basal metabolic rate is fixed. It's not fixed. It can go up or down by 40%, for example. So, it, you know, the question is, what controls your basal metabolic rate? Again, it comes down to hormones. So if you say, let's look at the energy balance equation, and it's calories in minus calories out. Well, focusing on that purely sort of mechanical level is like focusing on lifting gravity. It's, it's, it's not useful. It's true, but it's not useful. So you have to go say what's, you know, sort of one level higher in thinking, getting to the root cause. What is it about uh, the hormonal state that is increasing my calories in or decreasing my calories out? And that all comes back to the foods that we eat, the hormones that our body, like our whole body runs on hormones. Those are the instructions to, to what we do. It's sort of like the code of, you know, computers. It's, it's the the bottom line wiring of what we do and our body will follow those hormones. So you need to, and the food that you eat changes the hormones that our body secretes. So therefore you have to, you have to change those in order to change the calories and calories out. Fasting is another way that you can actually change the hormonal systems of your body. So it all comes down to trying to understand those hormones and trying to fix those as opposed to saying, let's just eat 500 calories less, which, you know, it sounds like a great idea, but the truth is that the failure rate of eating 500 calories less a day, you know, it doesn't matter which calories as long as you cut some calories. The, that advice has about a 99% failure rate in terms of long-term weight loss. It never works. And that's true whether you look at a study or whether you look at large populations like the United States or whether you think about it for yourself. How many people have done these calorie-reduced diets? Like probably everybody. And does it work? Almost never. So if we say let's look at the sort of bottom line, does these calorie-restricted diets work? almost never works and it's a almost universal finding so why would you tell people to do a strategy that has a 99 percent failure rate that's ridiculous and is one of the key takeaways from this part of the interview so far is that you know eating real food so that taking your calories from real foods as opposed to more manufactured and more processed foods is far healthier in terms of, you, you know, you fill up faster, you feel fuller, the thermogenic effect of breaking those foods down. The body has to kind of work that little bit harder because the likes of meat, vegetables uh, are, you know, are, are healthier for you in terms of vitamins and minerals, but also you'll be fuller quicker. You've got to work harder to break them down. And those kind of calories are the ones people should be aiming for. Yeah, it comes down to the fact that when you eat real foods, and that includes sort of you want to avoid processed foods like carbohydrates, but also processed meats and processed fats, for example. But it comes down to the fact that the amount of fat in our body, so our body fat percentage, is a very tightly regulated thing. So if you think about the way that we evolve, you don't see fat like grossly obese animals in the wild. Why? Because if you're fat, you're going to get eaten and you can't catch stuff. So you're not going to eat and you're going to get eaten. So the point is that those, people, those, those animals don't survive. So it's a very tightly regulated process. That's why we have so many overlapping hormones that do that. When you eat real foods that we've evolved to, you know, over thousands of years, we, those, those foods provide the proper sort of hormonal signaling. You don't have to figure it out, but it will automatically provide it because we've sort of evolved with it. So when you eat steak, you can't keep eating steak until, you know, you've gained 50 pounds. Like you will stop. Uh, and, and the same goes for like beans. Like you can't just keep eating beans, and, like which is a carbohydrate, until you gain 50 pounds. It doesn't work because your body will stop you. So you don't have to sort of count the calories slavishly. You just have to listen to your body. Because we've grown up, we, we, we've sort of evolved with those real foods so that we have the proper hormonal signaling when we've had enough. 
Now you eat a food like a, uh, you know, cookie, for example, and sugary drinks. So sugar is natural, of course, but this sort of high, high levels of sugar is not very natural. So you simply don't have any satiety signaling. There's, there are people that used to drink 20, 25 cans of soda a day. Like you read about these in the medical journals and so on. So that was the f first case of fatty liver disease. This janitor was drinking 25 Coca-Colas a day. He get, got all this fatty liver. I mean, you're talking about thousands of calories. I mean, I do, don't even know how many, but probably like 3,000 calories worth. But his body never stopped him from drinking more because our bodies never evolved with this sort of Coca-Cola. So therefore it didn't develop the proper satiety signaling that we could still be healthy and drink this amount. So again, it's, it's, it's just a matter of eating real foods um, and then letting our bodies sort of sort it out rather than trying to get into the nitty gritty of, and some people try to do this. It's like, well, we're going to give you this percentage of uh, protein and this percentage of fat. We're going to add back some vitamins, add back this and put it in a bar. It's like, well, you know, how are you going to get better than real food? I mean, that's the sort of human conceit, like saying we can make a better, better breast milk than breast milk. You can't. It, it's almost impossible. So formula is not better than breast milk. But, you know, sometimes you get into this sort of scientism where we, we believe that we're so much smarter than Mother Nature, even for our own health. And we're almost always wrong when we, when we think that way. So when people say, well, we're going to put it all so good for you in a shake or a bar or whatever, it's like, no, you're almost always better off eating a plant, anything close to natural form. So whether it's an egg or it's a plant or it's a vegetable or it's a meat, it's almost always going to be better for you. Let's chat about the difference between overweight and obesity uh, and the first couple of chapters in the book you have a fantastic line on it uh, and I, I want to I want to share that with our listeners and chat a little bit more about it um, uh, in terms of overweight and obese I mean it's really just a a, uh, a definition from a medical it's a uh, you know overweight is a body mass index of 25 to 30 over 30 is considered obese um, that's the medical textbook definition of that. I mean, I, sorry, I'm not sure which, which, uh, what you're, you're getting. To yeah. So, so in the, in the book, you say that, you know, about being overweight, that it, the difference between overweight and obesity is that obesity is when being, you know, too fat gets in the way of life and it gets in the way of living life. And that's very much the difference between the two. Oh, right. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, that's a better definition from a practical standpoint, from a medical standpoint, it's really, um, you know, it's based on the body mass index, which is not very, it's not a great, um, it's not a great measure for any individual person. But the point is that being a little bit overweight doesn't stop people. Like, so if you look at overweight body mass index of 25 to 30, a lot of people actually fall into that who are fairly muscular. So um, when I was younger, I actually worried about this quite a bit. I was, I was doing a lot of sports and I was quite muscular um, but my, so my body mass index actually fell into the overweight category, 26 or something like that. So it was always sort of puzzling to me thinking, ah, you know, I think I eat all right and I do all sex. Um, so, so being overweight is not necessarily bad. And the other thing is that, um, it, there, there's a huge change, like the, the, being weight is not the only thing that matters. But as it starts to get into the obese category, then you start to get put yourself at risk of uh, health conditions, primarily uh, type 2 diabetes being the main one. But as you go further, what you get is an increased risk in all sorts of bad things. So you get the heart disease and the strokes and then cancer. Cancer is very, um, uh, very much now recognized as a huge risk factor for, can uh, for cancer. So certain types of cancer like breast cancer and colorectal cancer. So it's a huge determinant, especially as you get into that uh, obese category. And let's chat a little bit more around uh, insulin uh, and metabolism and weight and, obese and obesity. Yeah, so insulin is sort of the major hormone that you really need to know about when you're talking about weight gain. So the question is, you know, in terms of the body is, okay, the body runs on hormones. Everything the body does runs on hormones. 
Um, so if you're talking about body fat percentage, well, what's the most important hormone? It's not the only important hormone, but it's probably the most important. And, and that's insulin. So insulin is basically a hormone that tells your body to store fat. That's not a necessarily a bad thing because remember, body fat is normal. Too much body fat is, is bad for you, but so is too little, right? You don't have enough energy stores. And if you're anorexic, remember, there used to be a lot of anorexia nervosa and so on. So too little body fat is also a bad thing. So insulin is sort of the major hormone that tells your body to store fat. So that's its job. It's neither good or bad. It's a natural hormone. But too much insulin is going to make your body gain too much fat. That's the bottom line. So you can see this from an experimental standpoint. So if you say, for example, that um, I think insulin is important, what happens when I give people insulin injections? And that's easy to do. You see it, we see it all the time in type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And the major side effect of giving insulin is weight gain. So you give people insulin you will gain fat, right? They will gain fat. And it doesn't matter how much willpower you have or you don't have. So again, this is what I remember being puzzled by this in medical school too, because I used to think, well, you know, I gave, I just started this person on insulin and they gained 20 pounds. But at the time I was thinking, but body weight is all about calories in, calories out. So why would it have anything to do with insulin? But yeah, it always happened. And the other thing is I, I, you know, again, mistakenly thought it was all about willpower, you know, not eating too much, doing more exercise. So how does giving insulin make people have no willpower? Like it doesn't make any sense. But it was never about willpower. It was never about calories. It was about the insulin. The insulin told their body to store fat, right? So this is the way it goes. So if I were to take somebody, and I can make anybody fat, I just... I just prescribe them insulin. I just have to give enough insulin. So you take insulin, your body gets the message to store body fat, okay? So all the energy that you've eaten, so all the food energy you've taken, all those calories, immediately goes into the fat stores, the fat cells, because that's what you've told the body to do. So it goes into the fat stores, and there's no energy left for you to run or to do anything. So you get hungry and you go and find yourself some more food. So the problem is not the calories in, calories out. It's the fact that the hormonal state of too much insulin has sort of vacuumed all that energy into your fat stores and now you have to go get more. And that's what's driving you to eat more. That's what happens there. And if you don't, your body will actually turn down how much energy it's using. So say you, you're, you're taking 2,000 calories in, 2,000 calories out. Now, I pump you full of insulin. All those calories are going to go into fat stores, leaving very little energy for you to do your normal activities. But you're very rigid, so you still eat only 2,000 calories. Well, your body has no energy. Therefore, the only thing left for it to do is turn down the amount of calories it burns. So instead of burning 2,000 calories in a day, it will burn 1,500 calories in a day because you don't have the energy to do more. What happens? They start to feel cold. You start to feel tired. You start to feel hungry. But you will still gain weight even though you stayed on the same number of calories. So it's really about insulin as the major kind of uh, hormonal determinant of how much body fat. And once you know that, is very important information because there are certain foods that are going to elicit a much higher insulin response than others. So cookies, for example, will elicit a very high insulin response compared to, say, an egg, which doesn't. So the bottom line um, implication of these hormonal sort of uh, changes is that some foods are more fattening than other foods, even for the same number of calories. And guess what? That's probably what your grandmother told you, right? I mean, it's like, who gets fat eating broccoli? Nobody. But eat too many cookies and snacks, you will get fat very, very quickly. So it's not about the calories. It's about the hormones. And that's what's really important to get people's sort of minds around so that they don't have to say, well, I'm cutting calories, so I'm going to stop eating these eggs. But 
hey, I'm going to give myself a treat because I'm cutting calories so much, I'm going to eat a cookie instead. It's like, okay, well, you just screwed yourself because you did everything wrong. Even though the sort of standard medical advice is that's what it's telling you. And that's what I mean. It's, it's, it's more this epidemic of really bad information that's out there um, rather than people not having enough willpower or, you know, that sort of thing. It's, um, or some genetic determinant for, for fatness and so on. It's, we're eating foods that are more fattening for us. And that's predominantly two things. One is the, the more processed foods are, of course, going to be more insulinogenic. And two, eating more frequently is going to make you secrete more insulin because every time you eat, insulin is going to go up. So you eat six times a day, your insulin goes up six times a day. Your body gets the message to store fat six times a day as compared to if you're to eat three times a day, your body only gets that message three times. So again, you look at the um, national sort of changes in our national diet. Not only are the foods that we're eating different, but the frequency that we're eating is, is much higher, almost double what it was uh, in the 1970s. So in the 70s, people ate three times a day, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Now it's closer to six. So that's going to have a huge impact. So not only can you change what you're eating to try and lose weight, you can also change when you're eating those foods to try and, try and make the changes. One of the key things I took from the book so far, I'm even more so chatting to you now, more, more so than the book, is the simplicity of your advice, which is it's very much pull up back to basics, eat real foods, eat little, you know, eat back to how we used to eat, and that will have a massive impact on your health. It'll have a massive in- impact on your weight, which is, which is, you know, and simplicity is is is, is wonderful. Let's chat about genetics and obesity. It, it's become more and more prevalent that you see on social media, on articles that you read in the newspapers about the genetic components of that we're born obese or we're born skinny or that we're born fat or soft or whatever it may be. What's your take on that? Yeah, the, the genetics do contribute a lot to your propensity to gain weight. So if you look at genetic determinants of obesity, it's about 70% of your risk of obesity is genetically based. So it explains the difference between two people, say you and me, say somebody is more prone to getting uh, overweight than some people aren't, but it doesn't explain the entire population sort of uh, an entire world actually becoming more and more obese because the, 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 the changes in a genetic population, like over spread over, you know, millions of people haven't changed significantly since the 1970s. I always pick on the 1970s because it's a time where people are generally not obese. So if you look at the overall obesity of, um, you know, the world, it's very low, a very low prevalence. So the genetics of the world haven't changed a lot in the last 50 years. It takes thousands of years for the genetics of a population to change, you know, if it's a relatively stable situation. So it's not a genetic. Uh, so the changes in, in obesity are probably not genetic, even though on an individual basis, there is a huge difference. That is, you know, some people are very skinny and stay that way naturally, and some people are very prone to obesity. Um, you know, it's it, it doesn't it, it it explains only on an individual level and not a population level. When you look at populations, you have to say there's something else going on other than genetics that is driving this risk of obesity. And it's predominantly the change in our food habits. And I always say, well, the 1970s is a period of time where people are generally not watching what they eat. So the habits, the food habits that they have kept them skinny, even though they weren't even watching for it, right? So it's like people always say it's about willpower, like obesity is a willpower. It's like, what, did, did all of America decide in 1977 simultaneously that they wanted to get undesirably fat. It's like, obviously not. So it wasn't a a conscious decision. It was the changes in our food habits predominantly that changed. Some people say, well, it's the cars, you know, people are walking more and stuff. It's like, well, you know, the, the number of cars in America, for example, went up gradually since 1900. It wasn't sort of stable and then jump up in 1977. What happened, of course, in 1977 was that there was a uh, government edict 
mandating sort of a change in our eating style. So prior to that, your mom would tell you what to eat and when to eat. After that, after 1977, the government said, I know everything, you should eat low fat. Uh, you know, it turns out it probably wasn't the best advice as we switched, you know, if you think about the original food pyramids and so on, they're eating 55% carbohydrates, which is okay if you're talking about beans and natural stuff, but they're talking about white bread and potatoes and pasta and white rice, that kind of thing, right? So you base 55, 60% of your diet on highly refined carbohydrates. This is sort of what happens. Uh, to a population. Jason, your book, The Obesity Code, is available at nationwide and globally as well. If our listeners want to find out more about you or follow you, give us your details. Yeah, so you can find me at my website is uh, thefastingmethod.com. So that's a, there's a lot of uh, free information on there. There's links to our YouTube. So you can find me on YouTube under Jason Fung. Um, and there's also lots of blogs. I write a weekly blog uh, on there that goes over sort of all this sort of science. Um, and you can scroll through the archives as well. Uh, so that's the fastingmethod.com. And there's a program to help people with fasting, give them the tools and the, provide the community that will support them on their fasting journey. And then you can also find me on Instagram and Twitter at Dr. Jason Fung. That's Dr. Jason Fung. Just remember on YouTube, my, my, uh, it's Jason Fung, not Dr. Jason Fung. There's some scam guy. Uh, who took my that Dr. Jason Fung and sell all kinds of garbage with my with my name and my uh, image on it. <laughs> you had such a great quantity of content. We'd love to have you back on the show for a second episode in a couple of weeks' time, where we'll touch on and chat about fasting and about intermittent fasting, and do a whole episode based on that. As ever, when we bring true experts onto the show, they fill up all the airtime with fabulous content. And I sit back here and listen and don't have to ask too many questions. And that's exactly what happened today. So we're delighted to have you on the show. And we'd love to have you back on in a couple of weeks' time where we'll chat about fasting and intermittent fasting. It's such a huge area. It's great to get a doctor to come on to chat all about it. So we'd love to have you back on. Folks, that's it for today's episode of Real Health with me, Carl Henry, in association with Leia Healthcare. As ever, you know where we are. We're at Carl Henry PT on Twitter and on Instagram, Health at independent.ie. Don't forget to rate and review some really fascinating insights into obesity today with Dr. Jason Fung. And we'll have him back on very, very soon to chat all things intermittent fasting as well. Have a healthy week and we'll see you soon. Leia Healthcare, looking after you always. Proud sponsors of Real Health with Carl Henry.